like Measure for Measure at Raleigh Little Theater, Time in in Athens is also not a well-known Shakespeare play. I wouldn't say it's one of the better known Shakespeare plays. Tell me a little bit about what it's about without the way you're updating it. Okay. We'll talk about that in a second. So what but it's really supposed yeah, to be. <laughs> what it's really supposed but to be. But it is on paper. Um, the simple version is that there is this uh, man in ancient Athens named Timon who uh, has great wealth, has tons and tons of friends, and just showers everyone with gifts and wealth. And then um, when he goes broke, he then turns to those friends for support, and they've all betrayed him. So um, he reacts quite violently. They banish him. He crawls into a hole in the woods, becomes a misanthrope, pays people to go wreak havoc in the city, and then kills himself. And that's it. And that's why it's bad and no one reads it and no one likes it. Because it's as interesting as it sounds. <laughs> well, and it's kind of like measure for measure. It's kind of considered one of those, some scholars say it's a problem sure. play. So what makes it, what like, makes it problematic? I think it's only a problem for a director. Um, I don't think it's a problem for anybody else, really. I think the, usually when they say a problem play, they mean that it doesn't quite perfectly fit into one of the other categories. I think by definition, if your lead character dies, it's it's tragedy. I don't know why there's been any confusion about what category it falls into, except so much of the dialogue is so sassy that it feels like a comedy. Um, I've upped the sass level. Um, I have to up the tragedy too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind of turned everything up to 11. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I've never really understood why it was as much of a problem. It's more of an authorship problem because it's obviously got multiple authors. I'm I'm on team Middleton, where I think it was, Middleton was the other half, that's what most people think it was. Well, and, and I guess talk about that, because people may not know what you're talking about, sure. so kind of elaborate on that for a sure. minute. Sure, so the text doesn't all look like Shakespeare's writing. Some of it looks like there was another hand, um, especially when you look at the stage directions. Shakespeare just writes like, enter, exit, enter, exit, fight, like that's about it. And then all of a sudden you have these three sentence long stage directions that are describing in great detail. Shakespeare's way too lazy for that. So they started to break down certain scenes were by Shakespeare, certain didn't match, certain ones didn't match his vibe. So they looked at who was around at the time, compared it to other well-known authors. And if you compare it to Thomas Middleton's work, who was another famous playwright at the time, you can see that his hand is in it. The challenge is that they looked like they weren't very good at co-writing so what happens is it's almost like Shakespeare writes a chapter and then hands it to Middleton, who mm. writes a chapter and hands it back. They may or may not have killed one other person's character or continued a plot line. So part of the problem is that people come and go, plot lines fall off cliffs. It reads like a really good first draft of <laughs> and, a play. And it's got the same two noble kinsmen issue, because mm -hmm. that was Shakespeare and Fletcher. And just like, it, it's obvious that like, you write this chapter, I'll write this mm -hmm. chapter, and then the scenes kind of go like, Pick up, pick up, pick up between yep. them. Yeah, oh, yeah. like a game. Uh -huh. It's almost like there's two plays. You could almost cut it and have there's two plays mm -hmm. going on. Which will probably make it also interesting for the audience it to can, yeah. pick. Yeah. Measure for measure is the same way. It's like there's mm -hmm. two completely different plays going mm -hmm. on at the same time. Um, and to flip it on its head, you're reimagining it in an 80s nightclub <laughs> with 80s music so talk to me i guess about your reinterpretation of the piece in a contemporary setting sure so in thinking about wealth and greed and excess i was thinking where where is a place that you would host a lot of people if you had a lot of money well a nightclub would be interesting well what's the most what's the um kind of epitome of american excess and debauchery since ancient Greece, it's probably the 1980s. Um, so, uh, um, also women were starting to s starting to make a crack into the business world. Um, so, combining those different elements, I said late 80s seems to be the right time to go. Um, so that was where that part came into it. Also, playing around with the gender parts of it is because, as we know, we need many, many, many more women on stage, many more people of color on stage more queer people on stage. So the great thing about Shakespeare is you have free game. He's not going to complain. Um, if, if he'd done it right, we wouldn't have to change it. Um, so 
um, it's a great opportunity to, to cast people who wouldn't otherwise be cast in certain roles. And you're also playing a little bit with music, at least mm -hmm. from some of the Facebook posts. I think yes. you're playing a little bit yes. with music. So talk to me <clears throat> how the 80s soundtrack plays a part in this production. So the first half of the show is pretty much wall-to-wall -wall music, kind of like American Graffiti is. Um, and sometimes the music is directly commenting on the scene. Sometimes it's merely there to set a tone. Sometimes the lyric is commenting. Um, sometimes it's there just to give you a certain energy. Um, and part of it, frankly, is I really like 80s music, and it was a great <laughs> reason to just like make a playlist and put it in play. It's kind of another thing that happened. Um, Tara. Yes. I want to turn to you because there's a lot of fight choreography as well as intimacy choreography. I want to start with kind of the fighting sure. piece of it. Yeah. Um, what are the challenges in choreographing a fight scene? We just kind of watched one, and these are not small fight scenes. These are kind of big fight scenes yep. involving a lot of people. So what are some of the challenges in constructing a piece like this? And what are, I guess, what is something surprising when doing fight choreography that would kind of surprise the audience? Because we're just looking at it, it's just a fight scene. but. Yeah. From your standpoint, constructing a fight scene, what what are some of the challenges, and what would be what would surprise the audience? In sure. That? Well, I mean, the biggest thing about fights is that fights tell a story, in the same way that in musicals, dance and music tell a story. So, if you just put in violence for the sake of violence, are you glorifying it? Are you just throwing it in because your actors can do it? It, it doesn't serve a purpose, and then it feels like you've just randomly stopped action to do physical action to go back to talking. So what's really important for any fight scene is to look at why have the characters stopped talking and started using their fists or you know, their legs or whatever they've chosen to use to get their point across. So it's very important when I start choreographing a fight is what is the inciting action that leads to physical violence? And who are these people? Because if someone is a trained military uh, soldier, how they fight is very different than someone who just woke up, who's been on a drug binge, who all they want to do is just rage out and go back to sleep. Like, those are very different, I mean, it, it, but it's, it's a very different world that someone lives in who has been trained, who hasn't been trained, who enjoys violence, who is afraid of violence, who is doing it for solely for self-protection versus someone who's doing it because they want to make a point. So I really look at who these characters are, I collaborate with the actor, who are you? Why are you here? Do you want to be here? Because otherwise, most people would just leave a room if a fight starts. So it's working collaboratively with the director and with the actors to figure out what the story is. From there, making sure that it's a clear story, because if fists just start flying, the audience just goes, there's too many, what am I looking at? So it's making all sure sir, that that story is very clear. This A attacks B because B has done something. C got in the way, C got hit. That is a very clear story. From there, we can put a lot of nuance in that who were their relationships was it accidental was it on purpose all of that um so i think i guess what would be the most surprising for audiences would be really the the detail of a fight that it's not just fists go flying it's the nuance of that fight it's the moment when someone realizes i can't escape or the moment they think they've won and then something turns on its head we call it a lot of interrupting action I'm gonna go run away and someone has stopped me and now I have to figure out how to run away again. And either I'm gonna succeed or fail and the audience is gonna really cheer for them. Yes, succeed or oh no, you failed. Like that's, you get them engaged with not only just the watching but the emotion. Emily, Hayden, Casey, you all are fighting. <laughs> You're in the fight scene. So from an actor's perspective, have you done fight scenes before and what are kind of challenges in fighting on stage? I, you know, I'm guessing you're immersed in these characters and things can kind of get really out of hand really quickly. So how do you kind of keep it controlled and what are some of the challenges? Well, one thing, especially with Bear Theater that we always have before each, um, run of the production is a fight call. So we always practice in slow motion. Um, and it helps to have a really solid fight choreographer like Tara, who I've worked with many times before, 
and I know that she knows her stuff and I feel very comfortable. Um, so it's a matter of, of breaking it down. So it is like, it is like a dance choreogra choreographed uh, piece. So, and even with emotions running, you practice it so much that it becomes part of the, the flow of the scene. I've been in plays where we didn't have choreographers and we were just supposed to flail at one another and that's not safe. Um, we were really fortunate. Absolutely. Yeah, one of the challenges for, for me is not getting caught up in, in the emotion of it. So every time Tara tonight said, you know, we don't have to take it very fast, just slow down. You can talk with each other while it's happening. Like, oh, okay, I'm about to like grab it. Okay, we're all good. Um, so that's helpful to have dialogue going as ourselves, um, as actors, while we're running it, so that once we get to a comfortable place. We're able to to get in there safely mm -hmm. and consensually yeah for me it's all about getting into the story and that's how i remember and keep everything in the right track and so as long as i remember what part of the story i'm telling and how i can help others tell their parts it keeps it very clear and even for me dustin why was it necessary or why did you feel it was necessary to bring in an intimacy director and then for all of you does having an intimacy director on set working with you, does it make you feel more comfortable to go further in your scenes, to kind of push the boundaries a little further? So I knew that this show might have, not definitely would have, but might have um, some instances where things got sexual. I wasn't quite sure where, how, but I knew that there was a strong probability that could happen. And I knew that I needed someone who had uh, the awareness, the sensitivity, and knew how to speak that language and, and follow those processes to, to make that work effectively. And Tara had already agreed to do fights. And I said, well, I know you also happen to know how to do the intimacy choreo. Would you please do both? And she's like, oh, okay, I guess so. <laughs> um, exactly. So I, I asked her to do that. So far, we haven't had a lot <coughs> to do. It's possible that more will develop as we go. But I wanted to be prepared that if we came to a scene and went, I feel like these characters need to do something that we have a plan for that and we don't just have to stop and go either just just on the fly figure it out or say, well, we're just not going to do it. I wanted to be prepared ahead of time. Um, so I can say that I certainly feel a lot more comfortable having a intimacy choreographer. Um, I have I have had my share of stage kisses. I dated one for two and a half years afterwards, and I married the last one. So I think it is very important <laughs> because the, one of the I think for me one of the reasons that I enjoy acting so much is that it, it does allow for a catharsis, and you can get emotionally. I mean, this is grown up play. You're all committed, and and there is a sense of emotional. Um, satisfaction that comes with doing a really great scene. We had some of that tonight in rehearsal and it was really, really nice. So when you add the extra element of like literally kissing your scene partner, uh, the touch, hormones, I mean, things happen. And so when you have the, a person who can help you navigate those waters without that um, potential vulnerability, it makes me a lot more comfortable. I have a six year old. I can't um, have another stage kiss that, you know, leads to something. So. <laughs> well, and I guess having the trust of an intimacy director, having the intimacy director here, does it kind of make you feel more comfortable to kind of, and, and you haven't had it in this particular situation, but maybe in other shows you've experienced it, where maybe there wasn't an intimacy director and you were feeling a little bit more guarded, and now that there is an intimacy director you feel a little bit freer to... I don't, I don't know if I phrase it that way. I will say, in the other cases where I had stage kisses, it was literally, okay guys, now's the time, let's just do it. Uh, it is, I was in college, and so we had to stand in front of the director and start kissing, and this went on for some time. Um, and I don't think this frees me to be more involved. I think it just makes it another piece of the blocking of the choreographer, good choreography, um, and it takes the, I don't know, like gray nerve endings yeah. out, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's, 
like we're not even going there. It's just it's part of something. Yeah, because what you said, it's very <clears throat> normal to have a very real reaction to a person mm -hmm. when lips touch, when hands touch, hormones, biology, everything kicks in, and especially as an actor who gives so much to a scene partner, you start to confuse one for the other. Mm -hmm. So having a third, a, a separate set of eyes who is there to remind you this is storytelling, that these are character-driven moments, and that gives you a safe place to check in and check out of the experience so you can come back to yourself. There's no gray area. There's no, well, was that, did they mean something more than that kiss? I don't know how, and you can talk about it very freely, open communication, can we change this because I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. It allows for a very um, open form of communication and then as a storyteller allows to make sure that we're seeing those moments for the story, not for self-exploration as an actor. Right? That's what I love about having an intimacy director with us is that so often it can be scary to do intimate work on stage in front of everyone, especially like in rehearsal, it's just like, all right, now make out really aggressively. And there are like 13 people all watching you. And then later there are like 300 people all watching you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I don't know how I'm doing this, but it's happening. And um, especially a lot of violence called for on stage, excuse me, intimacy called for on stage <laughs> is often violent as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can be very triggering for many people and to have someone whose job it is uh, to monitor those situations and make sure that they tell our story without adding trauma to like our real life stories, that's really awesome. Well, and Tara and Dustin from the creative behind the scenes element from the directorial standpoint, from the choreography standpoint, do you think that intimacy directing will become more and more the norm? It has I to. hope so. I yeah. very much hope yeah, so. Really I mean, be. when Intimacy Directors International became a thing, it's in Intimacy Directors International and theatrical intimacy education are currently the two big supporters, one for the academic, one for the professional. Um, and when, I mean, we had Alicia Rodas, who's one of the co-founders, come to Raleigh, um, when Jeff Jones, uh, Jeff A.R. Jones, one of the premier fight guys in our community, uh, brought, got her down here, was the introduction to our community. I know that because we all came, uh, she's also part of the Society of American Fight Directors, where a lot of the fight people train. Um, that has all kind of mingled into fight and intimacy have kind of become a one thing. Um, I like to keep it separate. I like to put my separate hats on. And certainly, I'm in my early days of intimacy choreography, so I'm also actively looking at the literature and the work that they are doing and bringing it back into my community because I want to advocate for it myself. I've been in enough positions where I didn't feel safe. I don't want that to happen to any of my other fellow actors and I don't want to happen to any of the upcoming students who are coming through mm -hmm. and joining their professional <laughs> world. I think it's, we can't go back. We cannot <laughs> go back ever. When we hear, we hear so many things about people um, behaving inappropriately in artistic settings. And and I would never want one of my actors to feel uncomfortable or feel like they couldn't say that they're uncomfortable or something doesn't work. Probably the primary, the primary thing I wanted was I knew that Tara was gonna be checking in with people and could say, what is your level of comfort? Where are your boundaries? That was more important to me than anything is I think actors, naturally are more likely to say, yeah, I'll do that. I think we just <laughs> tend to say, yes, I'll do it because we're people pleasers and we want to do the work and we don't want to be obstructionist. We want to do it and then put ourselves in situations that are uncomfortable. And I know that having Tara here, people are likely to go, yeah, it actually doesn't quite feel right for me because mm -hmm. they trust her. And just having the conversation, mm -hmm. just the idea of checking in I'm starting to see other theaters having people routinely more likely to check in with a scene partner because they've just learned that this is even a process. You're our advocate when we have to go in, like you can advocate for us. If and, we and, yeah, and I think that's very important that we learn. <coughs> You're someone who can advocate for us and it also gives us permission to self-advocate because I know when I was coming up through university and in professional worlds, I didn't because I didn't know I could and I was afraid to ruffle feathers, be considered difficult, lose an opportunity. Um, so if there's someone here who is advocating for you, you can self-advocate because then you know, well, I know someone in this community who can do it. So 
you're going to call them. <laughs> well, and knowing that I wanted um, a largely female and largely uh, queer cast as much as possible, I knew we were going to have a population of people who may have had some, some very bad experiences. Um, and I wanted to make sure that we were all coming into an environment that was safe and that was positive and that was constructive. And I think when the cast trusts each other and has kind of a just check-in process, it shows on stage through the audience. You you get that sense. This is the first time that I've had a check-in and a and a um, re uh, reaffirming at the end of the of the end of rehearsals, and it's fabulous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I already feel bonded, and I feel like I know what's going on, but I can be. You know, so it's cool. It's really cool. And and kind of to, to so. People know what you're talking about. Um, the reaffirmation was something. Reinforce. Reinforce. Okay. Re <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, so, Dustin, do you want to say what that is so that people know? Oh, so um, different theaters kind of some theaters have similar things, but at Bear Theater, the tradition is you do a check-in where the cast and crew that are called that night sit around and we check in how are you do how we're doing emotionally how we're doing physically you know is there something hurting we need to be aware of am i having a rough day maybe i need some extra space so we kind of know where everybody is coming into it um that allows me as a director especially to know you know if i've got an actor that is maybe you know having a really tough day emotionally maybe i need to be particularly attentive to that um, maybe be a little bit more sensitive than i might normally be because you know just barking things, you know, I try not to do that anyway, but to, to be additionally um, sensitive about it. And then at the end of the night, we do a reinforcement, which is essentially, it's almost like saying something that went well that night that you want us to remember. You want to support something that we had done. And it could be something so small. It could be a certain look that someone gave that, that got a really great reaction. It could be something all encompassing, like tonight we just had very good energy. So whatever. And What's great is you leave the show on a positive note. So no matter what the scene is about, no matter how violent or upsetting a scene or show might be, you leave having come back together, said we're a community of people, we support each other, we love this work, and you go from there, very different vibe going on. Mm -hmm. What do you guys hope the takeaway is gonna be from this piece? Guilty pleasure. <laughs> but the, I, I really hope folks leave just really liking it and thinking, oh, wow, I like, I, I, I feel like I shouldn't have liked it as much as I did just because it's so edgy and, yeah, I don't want to give spoilers. Yeah. How much of a, an, uh, an anarchist agenda can I promote? <laughs> you know, if we're going to go that way, you know, uh, it just, there, there are uh, a couple shall I say, more radically flavored ideas that are being pushed forward by this production. Personally, I'm really excited for the representation of queer people and all non-binary people who are involved in this production. We did a lot of thorough work with deciding pronouns by character and paying very close attention to respect of pronouns and speaking as a queer performer who has struggled to exist in a theater world set up for the binary, to support the binary, is very refreshing and affirming for me to have a place reserved for me in a production like this. And I think representation is really important on stage. Um, Dustin, you and I can have a whole different conversation <laughs> one day about how mm -hmm. critics perhaps need to be a little bit more sensitive to gender representation when they write about gender fluid productions <laughs> like mm -hmm. this one. Well, I, I, if, if there's a takeaway, I would like for my, my, my original excitement for this show was to have the queer characters be the heroes and for the queer characters to frankly get some badass revenge yes. and have some catharsis. For once we, we yeah, we, <laughs> yes, we finally we live in a world where the where the primary uh, fictional narrative for queer people is the AIDS crisis. It's primarily the narrative is the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. Um hate crimes things like that. All important things to address and important stories to tell, but that's not the only story to tell. Sometimes we are powerful and sometimes we can win and sometimes we can be successful and sometimes we can work together and 
create change. Now, <laughs> in this show, the things we're changing, you know, whether or not you agree with the type of change that our characters are going for is a whole other question. But I will say that I really would love for some 18-year-old queer high schooler to come in here you know, maybe somebody who's non-binary or struggling in, in some way trying to navigate the waters of it and not really feeling like there's a, a space and not feeling like there's a, there's kind of an anchor there to come in and go, oh, you mean the queers like, like take everybody down and they win mm -hmm. and they're angry and it's okay mm -hmm. and they're mad and they're hurt mm -hmm. and that's all okay and we get to win? Oh my God, that's so cool. Cool. Yeah, that's like, what like I'm done with queer placation. Like I know for myself, like I'm done placating someone or masking myself to like be someone else because I'm I am very queer and I love that about myself. But I have masked myself in a very hetero world for a very long time for good, bad, or indifferent. But to save face, I know for me, I am self enough, selfish enough to say that I hope the takeaway is that our community recognizes there are more types of people that can tell a good story mm -hmm. and that you are not limited by your identification, your physical representation, that that is not what makes a good storyteller. A good storyteller is someone who connects with the work and is able to embody that and say what needs to be said, period, and yes. a sentence. Mm -hmm. We have cast of, of, um, cast of different races, different sizes, different the age spectrum. Um, we've got a really diverse group of people, and I think a diverse audience deserves a diverse cast. And the more diverse your cast, the more diverse your audience will become, because like you said, representation is key. So the more that the stage reflects what's happening on the street, the more likely people will connect with the theater, and that it's not just... <laughs> um, I mean, they pay my bills, so I'm not, you know, but there, I, I want it to be, a, and that's why we're doing the, the shows at the church or pay what you can at the door. Um, pay what you can, including zero. If you can't pay anything, you come see the show, come have fun with us. Um, so that everybody has the opportunity to come have a night of, of fun at the I had rather be a dog, a beggar's dog, than Acromantis. Thou art the cap of all the fools alive. Wouldst thou were clean enough to spit upon? A plague on thee, thou art too bad to curse. All villains that do stand by thee are pure. There is no leprosy but what thou speakest. If I name thee. I'd beat thee, but I should infect my hands. <sighs> I, I would my tongue could rot them off. Away, thou issue of a mangy dog. Collar does kill me that thou art alive. I swooned to see thee. Would thou wouldest burst. Away, thou tedious rogue. I am sorry I shall lose a stone by thee. A bitch wolf. Foot licker. Scut. 